Hi, I'm Matt Stamey. I'm a photographer here in Gainesville, Florida. I am currently full-time as a photographer at Santa Fe College working in their marketing and communications department. Um, and I also do a lot of photography on the side, uh, whether it be portraits, weddings, sports, and I do some photography for um, the Associated Press, USA Today, and so um, I, I'm kind of a well-rounded well photographer. I was uh, a newspaper photographer for about 15 years, being as a photojournalist uh, across the country at different newspapers, um, and now I'm based here in Gainesville, Florida, taking pictures. Um, yeah, and so I've got a little presentation to, to give you guys um, some tools of the trade, it's a little photographer's toolbox. And so I want to start by asking, even though this is video, I'm not going to see or hear your responses. Um, like, think, do any of you right now have a device within arm's reach uh, that can take a picture? I bet most of you do. Um, everybody right now is taking pictures. Images are everywhere, whether it's social media, uh, commercials, billboards. Like, images are being produced and shown all over the place. There's millions and millions of pictures being taken. And so what I hope to give you with these tools are, are some tools, obviously, to make your photos just a little bit better than everybody else's. Because like I said, everybody's out there with a phone right now. Everybody's got their, their cell phone or camera taking pictures. Um, and with just a few tools in your back pocket or in your toolbox, your images are going to be just a little bit better than everybody else's. Um, what I like to call the, the, the thumb-stopping pictures, where if someone's scrolling and they see your picture, um, it, it's going to stop their thumb from scrolling to the next, next post. Um, so whether it's a group of friends that you're hanging out with, whether it's your cool dinner at, at a restaurant, or if you're working for somebody and they need images, we want, or I want your, your images to be just a little bit better than, than the masses of people that are out there taking pictures. So what are we going to get into? Let's take a look. What, what's in the toolbox? Here's kind of what we're going to be going over. Um, and each one of these is, is I, I use almost on a daily basis, um, and, and not every picture is going to use all these tools, but it's good to have them in your toolbox. Think of a, of a carpenter or a, a home builder has a box full of tools. They don't use every tool all the time. Um, but when they need that tool to use, they have it in their, in their box. So rule of thirds. I use this with every picture. You see rule of thirds everywhere. It's one of the most, like, if you're only going to use one tool, use the rule of thirds because it'll immediately make your pictures better. So what is the rule of thirds? There's your frame. There's your picture frame, whether that's your cell phone or your camera. There's your frame. And then you're going to make a tic-tac-toe board or hashtag nowadays, right, I guess. Um, so divide up your, your frame into, into the, the, the thirds like that. And where the crosses intersect, it's kind of a, generally, that's where you want to place your subject. Um, an easier way to remember is don't put your subject right in the center. Um, it's just more pleasing to the eye, the golden ratio and the spiral, if you want to get into that, that level of deepness of the rule of thirds. But generally, you want your subject where those lines intersect. So here's an example. And you'll see this all over. Um, think of a, of a TV news broadcast. The, um, the anchor is usually positioned off to the side, and so they can put the, you know, the information in a little image next to them. Um, you see it in all forms of artwork. The Mona Lisa, her eyes are in the top third. Um, every, everywhere you look, the rule of third is used in imagery. And so, like I said, if you're only going to use one rule, think of the rule of thirds. It, it'll instantly make your pictures just a little bit better than everybody else's. Um, the horizon line. Just keep the subject, keep the, the main part of your photo out of the center of the frame. That doesn't mean you can't ever do that, but just as a general rule, rule of thirds. It's a great rule to use, like I said, every time you take a picture. Okay, next is finding the angles. Um, what do I mean by finding the angles? And that's um, there's three different kinds <laughs> that, I like, that I like to keep in mind. Uh, bird's eye, worm's eye, and 360. So what does that mean? Like, if you think about it, all the millions of people that have cameras, um, most of them just walk up to a subject, pull out their camera, take a picture, click, done. Um, what I want you to do is try a little something different. 
Get up high, get a bird's eye view. How does a bird see the world? Stand on a chair, walk up to the top of the bleachers, something, get, get a different angle, get a different perspective of the subject than what um, everybody else is doing. And that'll immediately make your pictures just a little bit better, a little bit different. And it'll make people stop at your pictures and go, hey, I didn't think to think, see it that way. So think, how would a bird view this image? Or how would a bird view this scene? And go try to take a picture like that. Even if you're just standing over somebody, looking straight down. Um, it does a couple of different things. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into that next. But next is obviously worm's eye. Uh, how does a worm see the world? Worms are on the ground, right? They're in the dirt. They're on the ground running around or wiggling around. Um, and they look up. So get down on your knees. Lie down on your stomach. Put your camera on the floor or something. Um, just get a worm's eye view of the world. And what that does... Um, it not only gives it a different perspective, but it really helps clean up the background. Um, a lot of times backgrounds can get kind of messy and distracting with different elements that you don't want. Um, so by getting down low, like in this picture for example, getting down low and shooting up towards the girls drinking the water, it put the sky behind them. So their faces and their heads are against that sky. Had I been standing up, shooting it from my five foot ten height, I just would have seen the tops of their heads, these kids in the background would have been distracting and it wouldn't have been a clean image. So, worm's eye view and 360 degree view. I use this as often as I can. Um, it's, it's one of my favorites and it's, it's a great, um, just putting a little bit of effort into your making your images uh, using this 360 view um, can really, really help. And what do I mean by that? Here's three different pictures. The, the fisherman here did not move. The photographer circled the fisherman. Um, so these three pictures were all taken probably within a few minutes of each other. Three completely different looking images, right? Um, the, the light's hitting it from different directions, you've got a different sky, he's silhouetted, all by circling the subject. That's all you have to do. And so just like when you walk up to a scene, don't just snap your picture and be like, got it, and walk out. No, circle it. Look at, look at your subject from different perspectives, whether it's high, low, or from different sides, um, and you'll be able to make different images. And, and, whether, and, and how you want to use those images, um, you know, if you need a silhouette, if you need, you know, you, just, you, can, you can use different... Moving on. My brain went, went weird there. Um, half of 360 is 180, right? And so what do I mean by that? Not just circling the subject, but turn around. Like, Walk up to your scene or, or, or your subject and, and, and look at it and then think, what's behind me? Um, two things are going to be different. Uh, the lighting, obviously. Uh, like in this example, you've got this protester here with the sun behind him. Um, so you're looking into the sun. And just by doing a 180, looking behind you, um, it's completely different lighting. Um, and second, it's going to be a different moment. Uh, the, the example I like to use is at a football game. Uh, if you're on the sidelines photographing the action on the field, do a 180 and look in the stands. Look at what's going on behind you. Um, you've got the crowd, the band, the cheerleaders, the trainers, the bench, um, all behind you, as well as the, f the football action happening in front of you. So don't forget to just like turn around and look behind you. Simple. Simple little, little adjustments can, can add to your, to your images. Repetition. Um, Repetition is used across all art forms. Uh, it's a, the, your brain loves repetition. The example I love to say is, um, I, haven't done, I haven't counted, but think of that Taylor Swift song, uh, Shake It Off. How many times does she say shake it off in that song? Like hundreds? But you remember it, right? It sticks in your head, right? Like you know that song because she sings it over and over and over again. Repetition brains love that. So there's a couple different kinds. Um, repeating elements, obviously, repetition of elements, and then breaking the repetition. So I'll show you some examples here. Repeating elements is exactly what it is. Just boom, 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 boom. A row of, of cheerleaders flipping. It's just an element repeating itself. Brains love that. Eyes love that. Viewers love it's It's pleasing. It's comforting. So people like to see that. More repetition. Um, this is more of a background, like, like I found some repeat, this is my picture of re repeating elements of these bleachers at a football stadium. And I was like, that's kind of a cool background. That's fun. And so I kind of waited there for something to happen in front of those repeating elements. So 
you know, whether it's a classroom with like rows of chairs or columns in front of a giant building or anything that repeats itself, kind of just hang out there. Like find the repetition and, and wait for something to happen in front of it. Whether you place somebody in front of it for a portrait or you wait for somebody to run by or, like, or play through it like this kid, find the repeating elements and just kind of hang out there for a little bit and, and, and make some pictures. So, repeating elements. But then, if you break the repetition, eyes love that even more. It brings you, that, that, that break will make your eyes, or make the viewer's eyes go straight to it. So right here, for example, you've got red, yellow, red, yellow of the, uh, the graduates here, and then that one Marine sitting right there. Your eye immediately, it, it helps it stand out, because the repetition is kind of all one element, if you will. Um, so when you break it, like the, the viewer's eyes will go right to it. Um, so it's just a little, a little tool, a little trick to help you guide the viewer to what you want them to see. Um, and you can also start to notice, start to see through these examples how I'm starting to combine these tools. If you, like what other tool is used here? Like this is from straight up above, right? I got up on the catwalk. So this is the bird's eye view. You've got rule of thirds because the subject is in that crosshair. And you've got repetition. So you can start to see, starting to use multiple tools here to make your images. Leading lines. I love leading lines. It's so so pleasing and so fun to use, and you, and and like the world is filled with these. Um, but there's two types. There's physical leading lines, and implied leading lines, and we'll get into those. Leading lines are exactly what they are. They're lines within nature, buildings, wherever that lead your eyes to the viewer. The the classic is. Um, Railroad tracks, but that's too cliche, and I didn't want to use that one. But think of railroad tracks going off into the horizon. Um, this is a, um, a pier uh, here in Gainesville. Um, but yeah, the, got down low, use, use those lines of the pier to draw the viewer in right to the subject. And so when you see lines, you know, just l look out for them, and then uh, kind of like repetition, hang out there, wait for something to happen, place your subject in those lines if you're doing a portrait or something like that. Um, and you can use the lines to, to, to guide the viewer to where you want them to be. This, this line of palm trees right here. And again, you're starting to combine the, the tools here. You've got the repetition of the, um, the trees. You've got the rule of thirds. She's placed right there. The lines, you know, it's all coming together. You've got a, bunch, a couple different leading lines in this one. You've got the row of trees. You've got the swooping power lines, all right down to the subject. Um, yeah, so use leading lines to your advantage. And, and again, it just takes a little bit of thought, a little bit of extra oomph on your part um, to, to stop and think, where are the lines and how can I use them? If you just take the, the five extra seconds to think about that before you take the picture or while you're taking the picture, your images are going to immediately be better than everybody else's. Eye lines can be leading lines. You can guide your viewer through the frame by how the subject is looking. Um, you know, she's on this side of the frame looking that way. The horse is on that side looking this way. They're looking into the frame. Um, you, you can place your subject anywhere within the frame and where they're looking, human eyes are going to like like naturally want to look to where they're looking. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a crowd and gone and like looked up and then like everybody around you goes, oh, what's he looking at? It's the sa same concept. Like place your subject where you want them to be in the frame and have them look um, where you want them to be looking. Framing. This is another one I love to use all the time. Um, and it's, it's using, again, it's like leading lines. It's using elements around you and placing the subject within the, in the frame or in a, like in this case, it's a, it's a hole in this net. This father and son are out there playing roller hockey um, and shooting through this hole in the net. So you're framing the subject with elements that are around you. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a great way to um, help bring your viewers or help bring the viewer's eyes to the subject. Um, very, very similar to leading lines, just, just a different type. Um, you're just looking through something or using something behind them um, to frame the subject. Obviously this lacrosse goal perfectly frames um, this lacrosse player um, 
in the picture. It just um, encloses, if you will. Um, so, so use, again, use elements to help frame your subject. Um, it can be trees, it can be a hole in the fence, it can be anything. You can frame, frame people with anything. Layering. I, I had a boss years ago who um, just loved layers. And if you, if you brought, it, brought back a picture that didn't have a layer to it or a second layer, um, he'd send me back out to go get a better picture that had layers. So layering is basically foreground to background. Um, placing something in the foreground and having something in the background. Um, it does a lot of different things for your photos. It, um, it adds depth. Um, it adds context. Um, it, it's just visually pleasing. It, it, just, it just helps the images. And um, so yeah, you can see you've got the dancer's feet in the foreground, the dancer's hanging out in the background, foreground, background. This is also, that's why I put it after framing, a great example of framing. I framed these dancers within the legs. So again, adding the tools together. Foreground, background. Um, had I used a bird's eye view for this picture, just thinking about it, if I'd have stood right above him and seen just the water, it's like, cool, that's just a dude on an inner tube floating in some water. It could have been on a lake, and all you'd have seen was the water, you'd have seen the guy, inner tube, no context. But by getting out in the water, getting down on his level a little bit, adding the streets and the street lights as a background element, as a layer, it adds the context. And you, so you see this and you're like, whoa, that's a flooded street. That's not just some lake. Um, so it really helps to add a second layer to help add context. Um, this was after a hurricane um, and it flooded one of the streets. And these guys decided to <laughs> play in the August heat uh, and in the rain to cool off in the flood. Again, context, foreground, background. Like this is a pretty dramatic picture on, on, its, on its own without the cop running. Um, but you add that, that second layer um, and it adds a little bit of urgency. Not that a fire in front of a gas station isn't urgent already, but adding a police officer running from that, second layer, more context, more meaning, more meat to your images. Okay. So now we're going to get into a little bit more uh, playful tools, if you will. Um, tools that you can't necessarily use all the time. All those other tools you can pretty much use on any image you want. Um, these next few are, are kind of situational, but they're good to have in your toolbox if you want to bust them out. Um, silhouettes. I use silhouettes all the time. They're beautiful. They're fun. Um, they're dramatic. Um, and so basically what a silhouette is, is um, placing the brighter background in front of the subject. And so um, you expose your camera, and I'm not gonna get into the techniques of, of exposure, um, that's for another lecture, but exposing your camera for the highlights, telling your, telling your camera you want the bright areas to be exposed, and then anything in front of that, or anything in shadow in front of that, will fall to black. Um, so bright in the background, and then uh, shadow in the foreground. Again, it's layers, but silhouetting your subject. So skies, sky's the easiest thing to do. Um, sunsets, sunrises. Again, place your subjects in front of something bright and expose for that bright, um, bright something, in this case, the sky. And your subjects will fall to silhouette, or like, fall into a silhouette. Shadows, shadows can be silhouettes. Again, it's just, it's something bright and something dark um, and just silhouette the subject. Um, Again, if you're working for a yearbook or a newspaper, you don't want all your pictures to be silhouettes, but they're nice. They're a nice tool to have. Um, then you get to, uh, you know, like I said, have some fun. These are a little more playful. So the great thing about photography, one of the reasons I love photography, is you get to play. And I grew up in the film era, and so film was kind of expensive for me as a student. Um, so I was really cautious. But now in the digital era, who cares? Just Play, take some pictures, try some things that you wouldn't normally try. Um, if you don't like it, delete it. If you don't like it, look at it, learn what you did wrong, and try it again. Um, that, like that, that's the art of photography, right? That's what makes it fun. That's what makes it artistic, and, and like, just play around. And so in this, this example is, is raindrops on a window next to a stop sign, focused on the raindrops, and the stop sign's in the, seen there in the, rain or in the raindrops. It's, 
kind of cool, right? It's just a different way of seeing things. Just the photographer was like, hmm, I wonder if I could focus on the raindrops and, you know, it, it just have some fun, experiment. This is a double exposure. Um, I took this while on a hike uh, in the Grand Canyon, or not the Grand Canyon, excuse me, Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I was just there for fun, had my camera around me, and just, just playing around, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if I can do a double exposure. Um, again, just playing around. You might not like it. I don't care. I like it. It's fun. I might hang it on my wall. I might post it on Instagram, whatever. Um, but photographers need to do that. We need to experiment. We need to play. We need to learn. Because um, you never know, you, there might be um, a client that hires you that wants a double exposure or you might be able to use it for something that you're working on. Um, and just being able to know that you can go to it is a great tool to have in your back pocket. And so, again, this is a very personal picture just for funsies. Kind of cool. I think it is. Maybe not. Play with your exposure. Um, play with the settings on your camera. Uh, learn what they do. Learn what a long exposure does to your images. Learn what um, a high or a, you know high f-stop or low f-stop does. Like learn about how the depth of field changes when you change when you change your f-stop. Um, again, that's a whole other lecture about exposures and camera settings. But this is a long exposure. I was worm's eye view, sitting down on the ground, and I set my camera probably to 15 or 20 seconds, um, enough time to let the the Ferris wheel make a couple complete rotations. Um, just because I was like, hmm, that Ferris wheel's lit up. If I had a long exposure, what would that look like? What would the Ferris wheel do if I had a 15 second exposure? Um, it might be less because these people are not moving around much. But um, thankfully, the, the two ladies stood right there for a few seconds for me. And again, it might not have worked. Um, in fact, it didn't work. The first 20 tries, it didn't work. Um, I moved, something else moved. Uh, the Ferris wheel stopped, so it was only like a quarter circle of the lights or whatever. Um, but again, experimenting, digital, it costs you nothing. Just play. Just play. That's, that's the best way to learn your camera. The best way to learn photography is just play. Carry it with you when you're hanging out with your friends. Carry your camera with you when you're walking your dog. And um, heck, my dog is my test portrait subject. I, I use her for um, all sorts of portraits just to, just to play with because whatever. And, I, and I'm learning techniques. I'm learning um, to see different things, learning to see different lights and shadows um, and just by playing, by experimenting. And so it's, it's one of the most valuable things you can do as a photographer is just play. Again, experiment, have some fun. That's me. Um, photography is, is art. It's, it's fun. So I, I got a 360 camera at work and I was like, hmm, let's see what I can do here. Um, again, I don't know if we'd ever use this in a marketing piece, probably not, but you know what? It was fun for me. I learned how to use it and I've used the 360 camera for portraits since then because I was able to play with it first. So carve out some time in your day or in, or in your, your schedule to, to play and learn your camera gear. Okay. So all those tools, right? All those tools, you've got them in your pocket, you've got them in your camera bag, your toolbox, whatever you want to call. Why do we have them? and it's to capture moments. We want to capture moments. Um, moments tell the story. Moments get the reactions. Moments capture the feeling of, what's, of what you're photographing. And so you want to be ready. You want to be ready with your camera. You want to have your tools. You want to be familiar with what's going on in the situation to capture moments. Whether it's a, a big moment like this of state championship team dumping the coach with water, um, just just having your exposure ready, having, you know, know where the background is, know that it's about to happen so you can capture moments. Um, so it can be big moments or it can be little moments. Um, baby pouting a little bit while meeting Santa Claus, right? Um, and and the, capturing moments are, are, are what's, moments are going to be remembered, moments that you capture are going to be are, are going to stick in people's minds because they they lived them or they have lived them or they can relate to them. Um, again, I I was a career photojournalist for years um, and I'm still telling stories and still capturing moments. But I think one of the most boring things you can do is line a bunch of people up and be like, okay, smile for the camera. Like, lame. Like nobody can relate to that. Everybody does it, I know, and it. Ugh. But if you can capture your friends. Um, 
playing and high fiving, or uh, you know, your 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 dog yawning. It could be a moment, or just something that's not just stand in front of the camera and wave, or pose for the camera, whatever. Uh, uh, those types of, of photos just don't resonate with people. Um, or they don't stop the thumbs from scrolling, right? But a pouty kid, you see that, it, it creates a reaction. It creates, you either laugh at that, you're like, aw, or something. It creates a reaction, and that's what you're trying to get. That's what you want to get, is because that, that's what people are going to remember. Um, so big moments, small moments, whatever it may be. They're captured with patience. This wasn't, I shot this a few years ago. This wasn't the first kid to sit on Santa's lap. I didn't just walk up and be like, okay, I need to get a picture of Santa Claus and a kid. First kid, click, done, and walk away. Now, I stood there for probably half hour, 45 minutes, and got a cycle of kids coming through. And then, and then one, one cute little girl decided to pout, and then Santa pouted, pouted next to her. That's the moment, right? That's the, mo that's the one that stood out. So be patient. Take some time. Don't, don't just walk up to a scene, snap a picture, and call it good. Again, dramatic moments, big moments, small moments. This, this grandson was rescuing her, uh, his, his grandmother from their flooded home and, and walked her through floodwaters from their home way back down the street down there. Um, so again, having the camera ready, knowing the rule of thirds, look where I've got him. Um, the layers, I've got his family in the background, I've got the street in the background. Used all the tools so when I was in this situation, which was a pretty dramatic um, rescuing situation from a hurricane, I had the tools, I was familiar with them, and I could use them to make an image um, almost instinctively. Okay, quick, how many rules do you see? I normally say shout them out, shout them out if you want, if you're watching the video. Um, but yeah, yeah how, like, let's take a look and kind of piece and dig through this image to see how many, how many rules you can see. I'm sure you've already seen some by now, but I'll start pointing them out. Um, for me, the obvious one, like I said, rule of thirds every time, place the subject here, right? On the, the, the crosshairs of that, of that tic-tac-toe board. Um, so rule of thirds, you've got a little bird's eye view, a little up high, right? I, I, put my, I had a GoPro and I put it on a stick and I held it up um, to the cheerleader's level. Um, so you've got some leading lines here, right? You've got the perspective of the crowd. You've got layering, you've got the background, you've got the stadium and the crowd in the background, other cheerleaders in the background. Um, yeah, you've got a moment, she's yelling, she's got the poster up, and because they, they, were, they were doing a little chant or whatever, go Tigers, go Tigers. Um, I love to point, about, point out about this image, it's one of my favorite things to point out. You've got two photographers down here, two of the best photographers in the country, um, Baton Rouge Advocate uh, and the Associated Press. Um, they've won multiple national and international awards, some of the best photographers in the country. I don't consider myself at their level, but I'm standing next to them at a football game, or at a, a pregame for a football game. Um, and it's great to see he's got a different lens, he's got a wide angle, he's got a zoom. I had a GoPro. So you had three photographers at the exact same event using three different cameras, and I guarantee you we all created three different images. Um, and that's what's great about pictures. Um, but I was standing next to him and I was like, I want something different than what they're doing, right? I saw that they were there and I was chit-chatting with them and I was like, I want to do something that they're not doing because I want my pictures to be different from theirs, right? Um, I don't want to follow the crowd. I don't want to do the exact same thing that everybody else is doing. So I put my GoPro on a stick or a monopod and, and held it up there. Um, but yeah, you've got three different photographers at the exact same th scene creating three different images, um, all using different tools. Well, shout if you have questions, put them in the comments, email me, whatever. Um, yeah, so like I said, use all these tools. These are great tools to have in your back pocket. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and I hope this helped. Thank you.